stately plump buck mulligan came from the stairhead bearing a bowl of lava on which a mirror and a razor lay crossed. The start of James Joyce's Ulysses. In the 1940s, the American linguist George Zipf did a statistical study of words in Ulysses and found that on logarithmic graph paper they produce a straight line of 45 degrees. This turns out to be true of many other texts and shows something about how language works. Ziff also found this pattern in other areas, the lengths of newspaper articles, the populations of cities, always there was this 45 degree straight line. Ziff's theory was that it reflected a principle underlying all human behaviour, which he called the principle of least effort. Today this straight line is known as Ziff's law and it crops up everywhere the popularity of web pages, the sales of books, the amounts of people's salaries. Yet Ziff's explanation for it seems to have been forgotten. I think there are three reasons for this. First, Ziff may have alienated people by being strongly opposed to his country's involvement in World War II. He disliked the British, whom he accused of deliberately starting wars in Europe. And he said his fellow Americans who supported the British displayed monstrous deceit, duplicity, subterfuge and fake righteousness. He said he detected in such pro-British sympathisers evidence of paranoia, professional frustration, sadism, repressed homosexualism and other types of sexual maladjustments. As for the Roosevelt administration, it was guilty of specious logic, spurious correlations, verbalistic argument, and apparently deeply rooted personal biases or even venomous vindictiveness. For Zipf, Hitler's policies were a justified response to Germany's harsh treatment in the Treaty of Versailles. Instead of condemning the Nazis, he was more concerned with the American army, which he accused of looting, raping, black marketeering, homosexualism, the shooting of prisoners of war, and the like. He also regarded the Nuremberg Tribunal as a moral legal fiction. A second reason why Zipp's theories may not have been taken forward is that he gets carried away with trying to explain everything from why organisms die to why the sex ratio is roughly 50-50 and his examples here can be somewhat distasteful to make the point that people's experiences shape their future attitudes he gives the case of a girl being raped on her way home from school which he calls merely a painful first experience with sex to make the point that gender and sexuality form a spectrum, he refers to a man who, while copulating with his wife, enjoyed have a friend use his rectum for sexual intercourse. To make the point that people imitate others, he talks about a young bride in the hotel room on her marriage night who is afraid of what will happen if she lets a man insert his penis into her vagina. Ziff claims that in such situations, hotel doctors will cure the bride's nerves by pointing to the apartment across the street where persons like herself are doing what she is about to do and liking it. But did Ziff really need to dwell on penis and vagina? And was it really the case in 1940s America that you were likely to see people making love if you looked outside your hotel room. You begin to wonder how Ziff's mind works. So with these Nazi sympathies and prurient fascinations, was Ziff some kind of right-wing pervert? Well, he was born in 1902, graduated with distinction from Harvard University, and became a successful lecturer there. He published several books, the last being Human Behaviour and the Principle of Least Effort in 1949. He died of cancer the next year at the age of 48. Ziff's grandfather came to the US from Germany, and Ziff himself studied in Germany between graduating and starting his PhD. He was perhaps not a Nazi, 
Ebert sympathised with Germany because of his links and friendships there. There is nothing to suggest anything unwholesome about his lifestyle. He was a happily married family man and popular with his students. We can perhaps put his sex obsessions down to having read a bit too much Freud. The third reason why Ziff may have been neglected is that his theory is somewhat confused with various leaps of logic and parts that are actually wrong. Ever since Ziff first published his ideas, people have been pointing out that he was not the first to discover this law and that the data don't really fit the law anyway. The Ulysses graph, for example, bends down to the top left. If we stop just ignoring this as a glitch, the pattern looks a lot less remarkable. It is also said that even if social behaviour exhibits Zipf's law, this does not get us very far. Logarithmic straight lines can appear in data for all sorts of reasons, just like the bell curve is found in things from IQ to the weights of apples, without them being in any way related. But these criticisms kind of miss the point. The important thing is not the data, but Ziff's way of looking at the world. It doesn't matter that Ziff was not the first to discover his law. This is often true in science. Why Ziff is great is because his books are dripping with original ideas as he uses his principle of least effort to explain why this phenomenon is widespread in human behaviour. And in Ziff's day, everything had to be done by hand. Someone actually had to count the words in Ulysses. Today, a computer can do it in microseconds, so we have much more scope to investigate and refine his ideas. Let's go back to this 45 degree straight line. Now, Ulysses contains 300,000 words, but only about 30,000 different ones. If they were equally common, this would mean each word occurring about 10 times. But in fact, the, which is the commonest word, occurs approximately 15,000 times while there are something over 15,000 words that occur just once. On logarithmic graph paper, where the intervals go up in multiples, 10, 100, 1,000, and so on, this comes out as a straight line. To explain this in terms of the human tendency to minimize effort, Ziff said that we like to give words broad meanings, rather than have a huge vocabulary covering every possible shade of meaning. Yet we couldn't have just one word to mean everything. We do need different words for different meanings. So there is a tension between a desire to clump things together, which Ziff called the force of unification, and the need to separate them out, which Ziff called the force of diversification. When these two forces interact, it results in a compromise with a few common words and many rarer ones. Suppose unification began to win, concentrating more meaning in fewer words. Then the common words would be more frequent, and there would be fewer rare words. The graph would be steeper. On the other hand, suppose diversification began to win, resulting in a more even usage of the different words. Then the common words would be less frequent, and the rare words would be more frequent. The graph would be less steep. So we can think of the force of unification as twisting the line towards the vertical and the force of diversification as twisting the line towards the horizontal. The slope of 45 degrees represents a balance between the two opposing forces and any deviations from it imply some kind of imbalance. For example, the writings of schizophrenics produce lines steeper than the expected 45 degree slope with an excess of unification. Zip said this is because schizophrenics are poor communicators who overload words with private meanings and do not think about their listeners' needs. To turn to city sizes, there is a force of unification because we want to locate our homes and businesses in the city where we are closer to our work and our customers. And there is a force of diversification because not everyone can be in one huge city and we do need some people out in the countryside, on the farms, and so forth. Applying this idea, Ziff found that US city sizes foretold the American Civil War. In the early 19th century, they followed Ziff's law fairly nicely. But as time went on, a horizontal section appeared in the graph, implying a process of diversification 
as the US broke apart into southern and northern factions. After the war ended and the US was reunited, diversification went back to normal and the horizontal section disappeared. Ziff also discussed how the cities of Austria were bow-shaped on their own, but formed a straight line when combined with the data for Germany and the Sudetenland. He argued this showed Austria, Germany and the Sudetenland formed a natural whole, i.e. justifying Hitler's territorial claims. In the case of India, which gained independence from Britain in 1947, Ziff gave two different explanations. In 1941, before independence, he said the flatness at the top was because India was ruled from London, which was missing from the graph. After independence, in 1949, he said it reflected diversification and explained India's partition and the creation of Pakistan. This illustrates a problem with Ziff's approach, which is that it relies a lot on hindsight. Perhaps he is reading events into squiggles in the graph, the same way we can see faces in the wallpaper. It would help if Ziff could explain precisely how unification and diversification balance out to produce a 45 degree slope. But although he tries to do this, his arguments don't come up to scratch. His mathematics contains errors, and in the end he just jumps to what he was trying to prove in a complete non sequitur. It's mumbo jumbo. He also has his tool analogy. We must imagine a craftsman with his tools laid out on a bench. The tools he uses often are the ones he keeps close by. When he has a new job to perform, he will most likely adapt one of these, rather than one that is further away. It also makes sense for him to shrink his tools, so that he can fit more within reach, especially the nearby ones, bringing all the others a little bit nearer. Now a word is a kind of tool, and Ziff says this is why in language the frequently used words like the, of, and are small with many meanings, while the infrequent words like parallax and disconcertingly are long with specialised meanings. Nevertheless, in our heads we do not have to stretch past nearby words to get to more distant ones. Isn't it just that we shorten frequently used words because it makes them easier to say? Do we actually need the tool analogy? And this still does not explain why the word or tool frequencies should form a 45 degree straight line. Yes, some are used more often and some less often, but why this precise pattern? It is something Ziff glosses over. Despite such problems, Ziff's ideas are still worth investigating. He did not actually know why his law applies. But a person does not have to be right in everything in order to have fruitful thoughts. His tool analogy involves what is called a rich-get-richer dynamic, and it has now been shown that this can indeed lead to Ziff's law. Work is still continuing to understand the phenomenon at a deep level, and when it is complete, I imagine Ziff's principle of least effort will be part of it. In the meantime, Ziff leaves us an important idea. Not that logarithmic plots of data can generate roughly straight lines, but that the twists and turns of the line give us insights into social issues. Consider these plots of the ethnic composition of some Eastern European countries around 1990 and what happened to them after the collapse of communism. First there is Yugoslavia, whose populations of Serbs, Croats, Muslims and others formed a Ziff-like straight line and which underwent a multi-way breakup. Next is Czechoslovakia, with Czechs and Slovaks on a straight line, but not the other ethnicities, and which split into Czech and Slovak components. Finally, there is Poland, with no sign of Ziff's law and no pressure to split after the end of communism. So there is a link between Ziff's law and ethnic stress. Where Ziff's law applied, ethnic groups were in active competition, buffeted by forces of unification and diversification. Unification came from the shared ideology of communism, and once this was removed, ethnic diversification caused the country to break apart. The value of Ziff's theory is it tells us precisely when ethnic diversification presents a problem, i.e. when it forms a 45 degree line. Now, a 45 degree slope on a logarithmic graph means that the second biggest item is half the size of the biggest item. The third biggest is a third. 
the fourth a quarter, the tenth a tenth, and so on. So another way to put it is that ethnic stress is greatest when the second ranked group is half the size of the top ranked group. If the top two groups are evenly matched, neither wants to risk conflict. And if the second group is a tenth the size, it is easily dominated. But at half the size, there is maximum possibility of a clash between the ambitions of the underdog and the top dog's desire to hold on to its position. Something similar applies in geopolitics. In 1913, Germany's economy had reached just over half that of the British Empire, and the next year saw the outbreak of World War I. But during the Cold War, the Soviet economy was about a third of that of the United States, enough for tension, but not open conflict. Today, China's economy has reached the critical halfway mark compared to the US, making war become likely. OK, let's not take this too seriously. There are questions over whether the size of the economy is a relevant factor, how we should measure it, and whether we should compare China with the US or with NATO or the Western Bloc. However, the point is that Ziff's ideas have real potential for helping us detect, diagnose and make predictions about socio-historical phenomena. We all know that the rising power of China in a world where the US is determined to maintain its dominance is a threat to peace. What Ziffian style analysis can tell us is precisely at what point it goes from being a theoretical to a real and present danger.